Hello and welcome to Psyched, the show where we explore psychedelics through social, economic, and political perspectives. Next up, we have William Goss. William Goss studied, researched, foraged, and cultivated fungi for over 10 years. He studied under and was mentored by leading mycologists, Dr. Mike Davis and Dr. Thomas Gordon, department chair of plant pathology. He graduated from UC Davis with a degree in plant genetics and a minor in mycology. He was grower supervisor, supervisor and the water systems operator for Monterey mushrooms at the continent's largest organic mushroom farm. William implemented best practices for maximizing fungal cultivation while scaling a biotech startup, growing and processing mushroom mycelium, disrupting the conventional leather industry. He's currently the mycology director for the California Psilocybin Decriminalization Initiative, available for strategic planning and consultation in the following key areas, drug policy reform, best practices for laboratory management, scaling production operations, maximizing fungal growth, nutrient cycle optimization, experimental design and implementation, evaluating mushroom biochemical properties for pharmaceutical and therapeutic potentials. William, thank you so much for joining us and welcome to Psyched. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Yep, you're good. Uh, excellent, thank you so much for that introduction, Merrick. It's been really great getting to know you and uh, some of the other folks that I've heard earlier today and earlier this week. Uh, it's an honor to be here. And uh, I'm a little flustered, honestly, um, but uh, just bear with me. And uh, again, thank you. We'll get started uh, talking about the campaign and a little bit more about uh, my background in mycology and where we're going with the campaign uh, and what uh, decriminalized mushroom cultivation could look like. So. The mission for Decriminalize California is to promote research uh, and education concerning the healing and consciousness expanding nature of the chemical compounds found naturally in psilocybin mushrooms and to support a campaign to put a ballot initiative before the voters of California for their decriminalization and build the framework for eventual legalization. So what that brings up a few important points is the difference between decriminalization and legalization and the progress that is normally needed to go from one to another. And uh, we talked about uh, the naturally uh, found compounds in, in psilocybin mushrooms. Uh, you know, I'll just kind of put this up front, uh, you know, fan of the, the natural, fan of the synthetic. I think there's a role for, uh, you know, many different uh, manufacturing and production of, of uh, psilocybin, psilocin, uh, all sorts of natural products. And it's, it's amazing to see the uh, um, fermentation and uh, research uh, around um, like yeast that are getting used. And certainly there's a lot of efficiencies that go into that. Um, and also, uh, yeah, could be a fan of legalization, but uh, as many of the speakers earlier today have mentioned, uh, we've really failed uh, in a lot of ways with cannabis, and we'll get into that more in a little bit. Um, our vision uh, for Decriminalized California is a world in which people are free to explore their own mental processes, cognition, and consciousness as they choose. In particular, a place where researchers, guides, facilitators, and those with open minds and open hearts are able to investigate the healing nature of psychedelics without fear of suppression, censure, and incarceration. We believe that the transformative power of mind expanding compounds, both natural substances and their chemical analogs will help guide us to a better future. Uh, it's important to note we're currently in a prohibition era society, not just in the United States or Canada, uh, but kind of all over the world. And we're kind of making up for lost time. Uh, as our speaker said before, it yeah, feels like an exponential rate and definitely love to follow up with you uh, about some of the 
legal issues that we're facing now with our campaign, but I'll uh, get into our um, current status uh, in a little bit. So a little bit more about me. Uh, so I'm from the Snohomish land uh, in Washington state. I had my first psychedelic magic mushroom experience as a 17 year old. I uh, was with you know, a handful of friends and uh, across the street from one of their houses was a patch of Liberty Cap mushroom, Psilocybe simonsiata is a scientific name. And uh, ironically enough, it was, uh, it was at a church parking lot, like where I always parked my car to hang out with my friend across the street. Uh, ironic, serendipitous, synchronous, um, who knows exactly, but um, I, it was an extraordinary experience for me, honestly. It was what maybe people would consider a microdose or a subperceptual dose. Uh, I know a lot of people have different opinions of what a microdose is to them. I've found that I'm pretty sensitive with under a point uh, one gram of mushrooms. But anyway, so I got into politics actually. I was an Obama delegate, I did speech and debate, I was class and Kiwana Club president. And I wanted to get into politics to change the world, uh, largely informed uh, by uh, being raised by my dad, who's a lawyer, and uh, actually have kind of leaned on him and his expertise a lot recently uh, with the campaign, actually. So kind of funny to merge the worlds. But um, I, uh, I went to California to uh, go to Davis, as was mentioned, and uh, became quickly kind of disillusioned with the political process. Honestly, those classes were really boring, and I really had a strong connection to these uh, lead leaders in mycology. Uh, Dr. Thomas Gordon uh, was mentioned in the intro. Uh, he, a lot of these mycologists do plant pathology research uh, to get their mycology projects funded, and uh, uh, actually I was taught uh, mushroom cultivation by Dr. Mike Davis, who has uh, who had one of the only uh, DEA licenses uh, to grow for research purposes. He would also be called on to be an expert witness uh, in trial uh, for, uh, for drug-related offenses uh, concerning psilocybin. And sometimes he would be called on um, in the defense or, you know, prosecution. And, you know, the, you have to be unbiased uh, with that, um, that license. Uh, so it's really an honor to uh, not only have that mycology experience, but from these um, you know, folks that were steeped in the, uh, in the you know, cultivation world. Uh, so uh, fast forward, uh, after a few years of teaching and wanting to give back, I had an opportunity to work for Monterey Mushrooms as a grower supervisor uh, running uh, you know, up to a third to a the full production of a uh, of a very of the continent's largest organic mushroom farm. Uh, we would run production rooms from pinning to a third flush of mushrooms. Uh, each room is about five thousand square feet, and so we'd run around twenty to sixty of them. Uh, had a variety of different roles, but uh, we'll get into the cultivation a little bit later. I uh, moved up to the Bay from Santa Cruz. Uh, to work for Mycoworks, producing mycelial leather. Uh, so yeah, again, neither of these are related to psychedelics, but uh, it's been a, a fascinating uh, life to live uh, closely to the fungus. And uh, looking forward to going foraging in Mount Shasta this weekend. But anyways, I, uh, I, when I was in the Bay Area, I got turned on to decriminalized nature. And uh, at a meeting, and I think other March or uh, April of last year, um, it, there was an event hosted by Decriminalize Nature, uh, and there were a host of other Bay Area psychedelic uh, community groups. Uh, I think I was actually volunteering with one of them, setting stuff up. I invited a, a friend in, in analytical chemistry up, and I later learned that Ryan Munavar, uh, our campaign director for Decriminalized California was in the audience. Uh, I became aware of the, the campaign and the, the first kind of beginnings of it uh, through that event when I saw a corner table next to the stage where people were offering their testimonials of their experience with uh, psychedelics. Uh, there were uh, 
table full of clipboards with uh, empty spaces for names to be filled for uh, volunteering roles. And, uh, you know, having this like volunteer political background and interest to get involved, I really felt uh, the need to support the uh, perceived underdog in the uh, in this psychedelic event, uh, and and so it's just uh, kind of uh, it, it kind of rocked me to see like that there weren't that many people signing up. Uh, you know, this is a common problem for political campaigns. Um, but uh, the the following day, we had this beautiful event with like thirty people, uh, kind of a semi exclusive event. Um, in Marin County uh, with some of the decriminalized nature folks uh, and some of the, uh, the leaders of decriminalized California. Uh, so just to kind of reiterate, those are two different campaigns. Uh, decriminalized nature is, is fairly decentralized at this point uh, with you know, people all across the world now uh, getting involved, uh, kind of uh, taking a uh, kind of template and kind of running with it uh, in different ways. Uh, there's a whole spectrum of what people call like decriminalization or legalization. Uh, and uh, yeah, you can, yeah, but I'll get into that in a little bit. So at this uh, Marin County uh, meetup uh, talking about the kind of initial stages of decriminalized California, uh, I actually uh, was sitting right behind Brian uh, before um, uh, before I, I uh, met him. This is the first time meeting him and, I, and I'm, bringing this up, um, I want to talk kind of for Ryan a lot because he couldn't uh, be at this conference. Um, but um, but yeah, he asked me an interesting question that kind of like, uh, kind of connected to, to my core as a kind of a sci-fi nerd. He asked me the top 10 plants I would bring to space. And I'll, I'll reference science fiction in a little bit, but uh, it's just, you know, it's an important uh, kind of question. I think we have to ask ourselves about the foods that we put in our body. Uh, but uh, anyways, uh, from there, uh, I uh, got to know Ryan better and actually invited him up to a presentation I gave uh, at Humble State University at the Center for Appropriate Technology, uh, this like, semi-cooperative uh, workspace uh, doing renewable and regenerative projects. And I was talking about bioremediation, kind of a personal passion project of mine uh, involved. Uh, yeah, that's something I've, I've gotten some funding uh, to do, some uh, waste stream recycling. But uh, Ryan and his brother came up the, the like five hours, six hours from the Bay Area, and he was impressed. And uh, at the time I was working at MicroWorks, but he, he asked me to uh, join the campaign as the, the campaign mycology director. And I was like, sounds like a pretty good title. Uh, and uh, this is how I want to get involved. I want to lean on my mycology background, you know, uh, understanding the mycological communities, being a part of like the mushroom family that's found throughout the, uh, the country and the world. But uh, uh, kind of a close knit community hurt hard with uh, COVID with all the, these annual meetups that we can't be a part of. But anyways, uh, from there, I started, uh, you know, really tapping back uh, into my previous political experience and, uh, you know, understanding what I could like, best serve for the, uh, for the campaign. And uh, so I, uh, yeah, so um, a little bit more about uh, Brian. So uh, his background, uh, he is in the cannabis industry. He, uh, he helped uh, start the um, Monterey chapter of Normal, which is the national organization for the reform of marijuana law. And uh, he uh, had his first experience as a 25-year-old uh, with, with mu mushrooms and was, was impacted. Actually, I, I watched a, uh, he's on uh, camera taking mushrooms, which I thought was pretty unique in front of a, a news reporter. But Anyways, uh, he had a, uh, this profound experience for him, you know, different for me. I was like, this is pretty chill. Um, and, and he, uh, yeah, so he was also using that to treat his seasonal affective disorder. And uh, fast forward uh, into his cannabis uh, experience, uh, he was getting this um, political advocacy experience, turning on uh, Monterey County, uh, helping pass uh, and, you know, write and pass and follow up with, uh, with policy and legislation. And uh, from there, at, uh, I 
think at the end, yeah, in the winter of 2018. So at the end of 2018, he uh, he put together the first draft version 1.0 of the California Psilocybin Decriminalization Initiative for 2020. And, and from there into 2019 uh, was really the beginning of our campaign. And so uh, backtracking a little bit again, um, you know, the reason he got into cannabis, I think, and a lot of people I think share this value is, is the access issue. Um, obviously there's uh, folks that uh, are gonna make a, li uh, a living and livelihood, but for, for the rest of us consumers, we want two main things, which is, um, uh, you know, large access to uh, a wide variety of different strains um, and uh, a low price, very making it very affordable. And uh, part of those uh, other considerations would be uh, what you know that what you're getting, you know, strains of cannabis being notoriously um, uh, mislabeled or kind of misunderstood. And that really gets into like, what is a species? What is a subspecies? But that's a, that's another lecture uh, or talk. Uh, so, um, Ryan, um, yeah, Ryan, uh, wanted to bring this into, uh, into psilocybin, uh, and, and, you know, coming from a place of understanding the pitfalls of Prop uh, 64, uh, understanding the kind of steps through Proposition 215 that offered a medical kind of cooperative model, uh, to, to kind of get the ball rolling. Um, and, you know, a lot of people feel uh, justly that uh, Prop 64 uh, was co-opted and uh, wasn't done right. Uh, and it's important to bring up that, uh, you know, there's still people in jail uh, for these drug-related offenses. And just, you know, kind of going back in time, you know, there was this drug war that's mentioned already started in the 70s. Uh, 1973 was when the Drug Enforcement Agency was created. Uh, one important reason to bring them up right now is because they're involved in uh, helping uh, quell the the protests that are happening around the world uh, for well, the United States. I'm sorry, um, and and so this is you know what we're working up against and and backtracking a little bit uh, before that and with cannabis prohibition, uh, you know there was an interest in the timber industry kind of taking over hemp. Uh, the Hearst family was invested in uh, timberland and. Uh, one to use that to make paper and, and other products. And so hemp was uh, categorically and methodically uh, prohibited. Um, not going to go into that because you all understand that, you know, then the drug wars continue to today. You know, Reagan reinforced it. Even I read that uh, Clinton um, added 100,000 police officers, then another 50,000. And I'm not going to get into. Uh, the police departments and what they're doing right now, uh, but uh, it's just important to know kind of what we're up against with uh, the uh, funding and the empowering of, uh, you know, folks who would uh, arrest people uh, that are consuming or possessing uh, psilocybin or, or even cannabis uh, cr across the, uh, the country. So, uh, so, and this gets to an important point, which uh, we, what we've done in a lot of our meetings uh, for Decriminalize California is do like little uh, public surveys of our uh, of our audience. Um, we ask uh, um, we ask the question, uh, why do you want uh, psilocybin decriminalized or legalized or you know um, kind of some iteration of that? And what we found is uh, one people uh, one person out of twenty uh, would raise their hand for the uh, medical um, benefits. Uh, one person would raise their hand for the therapeutic benefits, and one person would raise their hand for the spiritual um, uh, connection. And then the other 17 out of the 20 people uh, take this as a freedom of choice issue, uh, which is important uh, in understanding that this is a more of a libertarian issue. This is a non uh, partisan or a, uh, a um, you know, non-democratic, non-conservative, although they may have some tendencies, but, you know, for as much as people are in support of this from either side, there are some people on either side that are also against it. Uh, 
you know, when asked about decriminalization, not necessarily legalization. Um, and we're going to go into what our version of decriminalization is. And so uh, what we want to do is we want to decriminalize the uh, possession, the cultivation, the uh, transportation, distribution, uh, production, and manufacturing. And uh, what this does is this gets us as close to legalization as possible. And what we want to do uh, is have this, uh, this uh, have psilocybin uh, and psilocin, and you could go into the basistine or basistine and beta carbolines and you know the host of other compounds that we have yet to uh, discover or researching right now. And first, take it off the uh, the the California uh, health uh, and safety uh, designation and and kind of deschedule it, take it off of those uh, those list of other compounds that are that are considered illegal. So you do that, and then uh, essentially you have to bring it into another jurisdiction. And uh, this goes to a point that Rob brought up, uh, kind of counter to that, and why I'd like to follow up with you is we actually want to consider mushrooms as an agricultural product so that that would be the jurisdiction that it is um, managed and uh, overseen as. So this would be the California Food and uh, Agriculture and Food uh, Department. And so with that, there would be a lot of uh, quality testing. Uh, and I'll go into kind of the mushroom kind of industry cultivation component of that. But uh, just going into what the campaign kind of uh, challenges that we have, uh, we have, uh, you know, the age uh, kind of restriction. So, uh, you know, we're not for full on decriminalization for, you know, children. Uh, uh, we uh, we drew with a line at 18. Uh, we may change that to 21 uh, for our next run at this. Uh, the other kind of challenge that we get, uh, so yeah, if if there are underage folks who are uh, in possession or, you know, that list, uh, what do we do with them? And so what we've come up with, uh, what we really want to do is not have these drug-related offenses uh, that kind of def um, defy common sense uh, be stuck on people's records. And so there would be a class that underage folks would have to take uh, to kind of teach them the importance of, uh, you know, a, a sober mind at a, at a young age or, you know, so, something that would be developed in the future. Uh, another challenge that we, we often get just kind of openly about, you know, drug reform is, you know, the issue of like drunk drivers, you know, people who are taking too many psychedelics and, and we don't advocate for, for driving behind the wheel or operating heavy machinery under psychedelics. So we want to, we want to uh, kind of, make that be known that we're not for full on, you know, anarchy when it comes to psychedelics, though um, we are, most of our followers uh, are in favor of what's happened in Portugal with their decriminalization. Uh, and it's also important to note that that came from uh, that policy, that legalization, uh, that um, uh, legislation came from uh, an opiate crisis out there. And that's something that we're facing in this country in a big way. Uh, and you know, if, if you want to talk about, you know, drug dealers and, and people that are kind of doing that, uh, you know, inflicting damage into a community and society, uh, we're concerned about, you know, these harder, uh, stronger chemicals that are being, you know, manufactured and researched by big pharmaceutical companies, uh, but have this impact. So it's important to kind of put this all into um, relativity. So uh, and and with that, you know, we are a minority of the population of psychedelic advocates and users. Uh, I've seen anywhere from 0.1% to 10%, but with a 10% of psychedelic use, people, I think, lump cannabis. But then, uh, you know, outside of the psychedelic space, maybe like one in three people uh, in some way have consumed uh, cannabis. And so those numbers kind of uh, play into the campaign part of uh of you know the the work that we need to do, uh, and and what we advocate for, and so I want to give a quick shout out to Kevin Matthews, uh, Decriminalize Nature, uh, one of our partners, the Beckley Foundation, who's been a big supporter of ours, and then uh, uh, Dr. Bronner's for helping um, 
sponsor and donate money for a very important poll that will help us, that helped us inform uh, some of our policy, but um, it'll probably be used more for uh, our next run at it um, because we are in a standstill of sorts with uh, uh, COVID-19 um, really uh, being kind of a lethal um, uh, jab into our campaign. Um, but uh, I also want to give a shout out to the Drug Policy Alliance. Uh, they've been leaders in this area and I know in the past they've had a uh, cut staff and and it's important to know kind of the people that you follow and you know help inform your uh, kind of outward look and uh, there is uh, kind of on that note there is kind of a prevailing theory about you know one drug not being uh, better than another and uh, realistically you know every, there's a kind of a drug for everyone and there isn't a uh, I, I think it's okay to kind of categorically start with you know cannabis uh, try to learn from that move to mushrooms and maybe next would be all psychedelics so it is something that we're open to but I think for the palette of uh, activists and and society kind of start one uh, at a time uh, and there's still a lot of work to do with cannabis and there's a lot of uh, you know even in California uh, yeah just just Quickly with California cannabis, you know, you have still um, three quarters nearly of the 58 counties uh, that don't have uh, access. So uh, going back to the uh, going back to the policy, so we take this to the health and safety code, uh, we strike it out. We have uh, there the California legal team uh, in the legislator's office rewrite it and. Uh, give us back a cleaned up version uh, and then we take that uh, draft and then make another draft based on the uh, the, the state's um, uh, process and what they've written and then uh, then what we do is we kind of refine it from there and so uh, we are trying to get as close to commodification without the um, without the um, yeah, a little to full legalization and what that would entail. Uh, this uh, would also include sales. So uh, one thing again with cannabis that we're hoping to avoid is the syntax and the local uh, control of each municipality. And uh, that's really kind of stopped the full uh, legalization uh, as we'd like it to see uh, in the state. Uh, so, uh, so once we've uh, kind of put that language back together. Uh, what we do is we run the campaign and the pro campaign is about uh, three things. Um, the people, the, the product or the message that we are, that we're pushing and then the, uh, the process and kind of how we accomplish that. So we have over 1500 volunteers uh, starting that we kind of focus on the people and setting up our team. Uh, then uh, and then within the people, we have a few different uh, types of people. So we have the uh, uh, the people that are the the callers. These are kind of like social media influencers nowadays. Uh, we have the the kind of grunts that do the, uh, the actual signature collecting and like standing out on the um, the sidewalk or you know pounding on doors. Uh, we we also go to brick and mortars and train employees so that they can uh, be you know a hub. Uh, for signature collecting um, and and that also helps with marketing to make these collaborations and uh, and so yeah what we will hope to do is as uh, as we have is keep this as open source as possible uh, we want to follow models like the land grant universities that give back to the community and uh, even though you know I do understand the importance for you know, keeping things private and uh, making profits and you know, patenting things, you know, those patents do go away over time. And there are, you know, versions of these products that we want to make more accessible for folks. Uh, so uh, uh, part of our products, we got merchandise uh, on our shirts, we, uh, we want to have people put their testimonials on the back so that they can understand their, uh, their own kind of message and connection to the campaign and their own 30 second elevator speech. Uh, in California, quickly, we have uh, 12 and a half million registered voters that, that are actively voters, uh, 
3.2 million voters are in Los Angeles County, and that's where our headquarters are at. And so I was staying with Ryan uh, in his apartment in Hollywood for uh, the last few months uh, as we started to wrap up the campaign. Uh, we ha I had one week of in-person meetings uh, with the different counties, uh, and then we had to stop things with COVID. And so I'll just end with... Uh, you know where we're at right now is we are challenge we are pushing the issue that COVID has presented to us uh, that we were stopped uh, from essentially collecting signatures and what we are now pushing for our electronic signature collecting and uh, you can go to change.org slash I sign digitally and sign that petition and this would help not just our campaign uh, make psilocybin accessible but also make any issue uh, more accessible and more democratic and something that is near and dear to my heart. It's a pivot from psychedelics, but it would help uh, not just our state, but the, the world and kind of like where we're, where we're heading with uh, voter suppression. And I think I'm pretty much at about time. Uh, I've really been enjoying teaching people mushroom cultivation, you know, starting with agar into spawn production and and various uh, fruiting models. And that's something that we're gonna keep up because it's a great way of networking and really making this accessible. Uh, we offer scholarships for folks that wanna volunteer their time for the campaign uh, over paying for the class themselves. So uh, please check out decrimca.org. Uh, you, you can find us on all the social media. You can find our initiative on there. So check that out. You can send me an email, will at decrim. Uh, ca.org uh, and I guess I'll open it up uh, for questions uh, from there if I have any more time. <laughs> hey well thank you so much for sharing really appreciate it. Um, we're just about uh, out of time. I, I do want to ask one question though. Um, so you're very involved in kind of both the mycological side of all of this as well as the policy side. Uh, do you feel like there's actually quite a lot of a lot of intersection or most of the mycologists that you know pretty involved in the decriminalized movements or are most just kind of involved with their little sphere and they're not really paying mm -hmm. attention to what's going on? That's a great question because I immediately ran into this as an issue reaching out to the various mycology societies and they didn't want to touch this with a 10 foot pole. You know, these are mm. family organizations, uh, they're nonprofits and there is a kind of like a gray area where you can support. Uh, the more favorable ones will allow you to make a, a quick little spiel in their uh, announcement section at a meeting, but don't want you like collecting signatures, but I was able to pass out buttons and stickers and things like that. So <laughs> I think we're going to start seeing more uh, mycologists kind of step out of the woodwork and and want to help kind of inform the the zeitgeist because uh, yeah there there's issues that we uh, that we can immediately solve with with knowledge and and getting good information out there and yeah the mycology community is great they're a bunch of mushroom nerds that you know like to spend the time outside and eat, like eat the the food that they forage so definitely appreciate that side and it's also important to note like these psychedelic mushrooms grow in the soil. They grow on wood chips in human disturbance, which is an odd thing, kind of telling of the, the, the power that they offer us. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Well, well, thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. And uh, looking forward to chatting more soon. Thank you. Be well. <laughs>